you know, we talked about Ben Johnson coming in here and calling plays, but then like, can you even be an offensive genius with this talent on the field? And I was, I was part of uh, the chat in one of the podcasts where somebody asked the question of like, uh, has Ryan Poles neglected the offensive line? And so I guess it really determined, it's determined by what your definition of neglect is because he has drafted five offensive linemen, right? One of them in the first round, Darnell Wright. One of them in the third round, Kieran Amagaji. And I believe you have Braxton Jones in the fifth. And then the other ones are, um, what's his name? Uh, Kramer and uh, Jatiri. Kramer and Jatiri Carter. Exactly. Doug Kramer was in Jatiri Carter. So have you really neglected it? No. Have you invested well into it? No. You sat there. You haven't gotten a center. You've band-aided that over and over and over. So that's why I'm almost kind of like, leaning more towards just get somebody who knows what they're doing in here because you, you're not at a point, you know, we did always talk about playing checkers before you play chess. You're not playing checkers yet. Like, so to be trying to play chess with its town on the field, you might get the same exact result. And so that you look at Ryan Poles and you start to criticize his team building um, philosophy, the way he approached it. You know, we were big on trying to trade back in the draft from pick nine, getting a defensive end and getting a center. Why? Because that would be more impactful this year than wide receiver three. It's not that I don't like Rome. I even, you know, you you said you got blessed for stuff than you said. I said I I wouldn't take Marvin Harrison Jr. at nine because we're not in that position. And I got blasted for it. So I think it really falls on Ryan Poles as like failing to build this thing. Guys, we were the best team of first overall pick quarterback had ever stepped into, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then all of a sudden now we don't have that right now. It's uh, but I, I want to say this too, cause I want to, I, I love what you said about that because something that I'm trying to get to catch on is the don't draft running, don't draft wide receivers high. And I mean this Huge like from that. the analytics perspective, cause I was diving into it. It's the only high value position that you can get in later rounds besides round one. Pretty it's, much. We and, gotta, we gotta send Brad dude, the link about, like, Yeah, yeah. I'll episodes. send you I'll send you a couple <laughs> links, man, where we do break oh. it down as well. Like top 10 wide receiver picks, you got to go back to Keenan Johnson, right? No, or, uh, you know, Keenan, uh, what's his name? Keenan for the no, Jets. Keyshawn. Keyshawn. Keyshawn oh, Johnson. yeah, yeah. 96. He was the last top 10 wide receiver pick to win a super. Well, it wasn't with the team that even drafted him. But it's like these guys over and over, like it's it's a bad move, even if they work out. It's just yeah. not a good team building move. You, well, you can find the, Antonio Brown in the fifth. You can find Tyreek Hill in the fifth. You can find Puka Nakua in the uh, fifth. You can find Cooper, Cup, Cooper like, Cup in the third. You can find Devontae. these guys. Devontae Adams was a second round pick. Like, no, first round picks, get a tackle, defensive end, defensive tackle. That's what and you should be for. That yeah. was the biggest thing is that when you look at like the premium position, when you look at who you have to draft in the first round, it's offensive tackles. The best off the best offensive tackles come in the first round. Yeah, it's nice that you got Braxton Jones and stuff like that, but the next level people, they don't make people like that on earth. They don't make the defensive ends, the D tackles, because right now we're seeing the defensive tackle market. We can't do anything with it because they're everyone's signing those guys away. And so the top of the line people. You have to use those first round picks on D tackles, D ends and offensive tackles and quarterbacks. Like that's what all the numbers show corners are around there, but it's real, but you can see what the corners go in the open market and how easily people are trading them for like a fifth round pick, a fourth round pick. And yeah, I, I wasn't a huge fan of Rome, but it's one of those things where it's like, since everybody else really liked it, it's like, it's. Okay, like, you know, I'm fine with it, but I love Jared Verse and I love Byron Murphy coming out. And those were my two darlings coming out. So, dude, yeah, we should have had you on with us because it's a, you're like repeating everything that, <laughs> that we had said in the past. But it's like damning because like during our live show during the draft, we drafted Roman David was like, no, <laughs> it, 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 it's yeah, because it's nothing against Rome. It's everything against where you are. Like the first defensive player was taking a pick 16. You could have drafted drop back multiple spots and still had your pick of the litter at any defensive guy. And I said it at the time, you can't convince me that there isn't going to be one of these guys yeah. that pans out and makes a difference. And then go get yourself a, a center in round two. 
You didn't have, need one. With the value that that pick was garnering at the time, I would venture to say you probably could have gotten down to 13, probably got the same year's second and maybe a fifth next year or something like that. And with that combination of players, you come out of that with Caleb Williams, Jared Verse, or uh, like who you were saying, the, the defensive tackle from Texas, who I also yeah, Byron Murphy, uh, Byron Murphy, Jr., uh, the third or second, whichever. And then Jackson Powers Johnson gets taken 44th overall. And I yeah. remember this specifically because I love Jackson Powers Johnson. And then I forget who the second favorite uh, center was, Brad, if you are a draft guy. Uh, Zach Frazier. Uh, yeah, Zach, Zach Frazier is uh, Steelers now. Steelers friend told me, we got to steal with this kid, man. And he is absolutely killing it. He's a borderline pro bowler on the Steelers this year. He's like entering that upper tier, upper echelon of like centers already. So you're pulling the words right out of our mouths. And um, just to address this comment real quick, Malik Neighbors is going to be a beast, though. I agree, Yada. Um how much you want to bet he's not re-signing with the Giants and he'll be a beast on some other team in three to four years. Yeah, or like how much you want to bet that he's not going to get a Super Bowl ring. With the Giants, because he won't matter. Randy Moss does not have a Super Bowl ring, guys. Oh, Randy yeah. fucking Terrell Owens? Like, oh, New England? No, no, no. <laughs> Terrell Owens? It's, it's damning, man, no, because like those no guys, those guys dictate money, man. And when you dictate finances, you dictate how your team's supposed to function. And you know what I mean? And it's, it is a game of finances. That's why we also said like, Hey, you drafted two offensive guys, the top 10 picks. Okay. So that tells me at some point this year, you need to lean on the offense. That yeah. point should have been Arizona. In my opinion, that's where the defense started to give up more. And you should have been able to lean on your offense. And it was just an utter failure. I mean, we're, this kind of leans back into the percentage of blames. Um, Dave loves neighbors. I do love, uh, I do like, uh, I do like Malik neighbors. Um, but this is kind of the point of the team building aspect of it, right? Is okay, great. You have Roma Dunze and he's been moderately healthy on the team this year. And it's been going pretty well for him in the sense of like, yeah, he doesn't look like a total bust, but he's not producing. However, now let's say you did draft a, a center and a defensive end, and you're going into next year, and all the same things are just happening right now, but you do have a center and a nice defensive end to go into the new head coaching saga or whatever, and guess what we could do with a third or second round pick and be just as excited for this draft? Grab another wide receiver because you could have gone into this year and been pretty excited, but if you had a solid offensive line and you had a nice defensive end and that you could have gotten from this year – and you're going into this year's draft, we would have been just excited, just as excited with whoever we took in the third round as we are with Roma Dunze. And now we're going into next year hoping that you can patchwork this with two to three brand new offensive linemen who are young and hopefully can mesh and gel. I would have rather have developed that chemistry this year, even through this shit, even through the struggles. And then next year, gotten a wide receiver that you could plug in and then you could just say, hey, kid, just go catch some balls. Everything else has already been figured out for you. And, and then Brad, Dave also made the point like, right before the draft or during the draft right after i don't remember but um no it was before he said well okay if you're taking caleb williams number one that's the gamble like so so these quarterbacks get good enough to where they make receivers out of no name we kind of saw it with deandre carter a little bit like he had some chemistry with deandre carter more than yeah. he's had with tyler scott you know initially it was more than he had with roma Dunze. and it's just like okay so like Throughout the past, you have these guys that make wide receivers out of nothing. You see the Chiefs trading away Tyree Kill, right? Because Patrick Mahomes is now good enough to sit there and elevate the rest of these guys. And so, you know, the way I, like, came to terms with it, it's like, okay, well, I guess you're trying to give them all the weapons so there's no excuse not to succeed. Oh, yeah, but fuck the offensive line, right? Yeah, I you feel know? like... I feel like he wants Rome to actually be the number one too. Cause like, I feel with their chemistry right now, over probably defense. should be right. I think this is, this is stuff that you can watch on any one of these quarterback channels, right? Like Tim Jenkins or uh, uh, Dan Orlovsky or anything like that. The misuse of positions and just basic concepts of fundamentals and receivers and all that. Rome, Roma Dunze is your ex receiver 10 times out of 10. And he's not currently right now. Somebody did the the analysis. He's not even in on 12 personnel. They're putting in Keenan Allen and DJ Moore. And yeah. Keenan Allen has his deepest targets per route this year than he ever has in his entire career in his prime. So they're asking a guy who is a over-the-middle merchant 
a slot receiving merchant, a guy who is a six, seven yards guaranteed to run 13 yards and be a jump ball receiver. When you have a guy on the fucking roster that is built to do that and you're misusing everybody, it is a fundamental high school college level of ineptitude that we're seeing right now in terms of like player usage, scheming, all that stuff. But that goes back to what we were yeah. talking about. And Tyler Scott's a smaller guy that he's a speed guy that's supposed to be able to stretch the field. There is, de- they're like schematically, there is definitely a spot where you can utilize that type of wide receiver. Yeah. I just like with, with Scott, I don't see the, the wide receiverness out of him though. Like that's, that's my thing, but it's the thing like to Dave's point, we're not using the weapons we have, right? We have all these weapons, but to that point, I remember when Keenan was signed, looking at it, his production was going downhill when he was the X receiver until he was moved. Like basically exclusively, he was playing slot for the chargers And then, yeah, like that's a really good, I never really thought of it that way, Dave, where it's, yeah, they're putting him outside and it's like, why are you doing that? Like he literally was seeming like he was cooked when he was playing outside and it was found the life inside, but now, yeah, why not just, they're they're throwing him on the outside and everything like that. So, yeah, it's It's frustrating. To lead back into that conversation we were talking about this with and moving back into your point, like percentages of blame. And I know you're kind of I w- we were having it out a little bit yesterday where I said, you know, well, if you don't want to blame the McCaskies, which is where we're going to eventually end up with me mostly doing that. Then I said that you have to you have to significantly change your tune. I did a whole episode week two or three about are we sure Ryan Poles is good? Because I was a little, I was sniffing this out a little bit. I probably gave me a nice forty-five minutes where I presented about five pages of notebook evidence. Where other than the Carolina trade, Ryan Poles, his best, his best skill as a GM is not drafting. It's not, it's not that good. His track record is not very good. It's using his track up until this year, especially using his draft picks to pick up players in a trade. And this year, particularly, it's going really, really poorly. But he, you know, traded a fourth for Keenan Allen. I think on the surface, especially what you're seeing with what DeAndre Hopkins went for in the midseason when you go into other areas, um, I think, uh, generally speaking, he does use his draft pick capital pretty well to get other players. But up until this year, it's not drafting players. It's he has hits and misses like Montez Sweat. For every Montez Sweat, there's a Chase Claypool. For every Keenan Allen, there's a Ryan Bates. That's probably the thing he's been the best at. And then in terms of fleecing the Panthers, that's what his career is going for. Right now, it's all kind of downhill and it's going worse. And so I told Polly he better start changing to Ryan Poles might suck now. Because if you can't blame them, Caskies, you need to really blame Ryan Poles, I would say. And so... Uh, sorry, Brad. Do you got something to comment on it? First off, I was just going to say, what's up to Philip? How's it going? <laughs> so I'm out yeah, there. you know, I waited to put that comment up. He, he <laughs> text, uh, put that in there a while ago, but I was like, we're going to get there. We're, we're working our way up to the top. But yeah, I mean, that's a, it's, it's a take that a lot of people agree with for the, sure. The thing too, and what I feel like with Ryan Poles that I've consistently said is his, it's his signings of free agents that I don't agree with where you know, we everybody's heard this, the low value positions, high value positions, who to sign, who not to sign. They trade away Roquan Smith. And it's like, cool, we did that. And then we got TJ Edwards, where it's like awesome. We got him for like six million a year. This is this is pro masterclass GM. This is amazing. And then all of a sudden I get the the pop-up of Bears just signed Tremaine Edmonds for $18 million a year. And I'm like, ah, oh, no, like why why did we just do that? And then we sign. DeAndre Swift, a a running back to a large contract when we got rid of David Montgomery. So it's these things where I'm like, oh, he made the right decision at the beginning, but then he does these other things where you're like, okay. And we kind of talk about like the Nate Davis, Nate Davis as a player, he's, he's been a good guard in the NFL, but if your whole thing is like the, the whole hits principle and stuff, and you didn't know that this guy doesn't practice. And what happened? He got his money and he's gone. Like he's not playing for you anymore. And the, the blatant lack of looking at the center position is something that drives me bonkers because you have 
like, and I said this when on my show consistently, because people were like, we need offensive line. If you're someone that says that, ask yourself what position, because it's five card poker, right? If you have a bad hand, you can't just be like, man, I need more cards. It's like, no, what are you putting in? Because you can't, you can't swap people out like you do with defensive line. So my whole piece was you have Darnell right at right tackle, right? So you have him. Then you have Tevin Jenkins, who we all agree is good. You just need to have a backup that's there because he's guaranteed going to miss like, you know, five games. And then Braxton Jones. What do you think of Braxton? Where they were hoping that he would at least turn into something. And then Nate Davis. What do you have with him? And it's up to them to identify what they're going to get out of Nate Davis. And then also the center. You didn't even add a center. You added a below average center and he's giving you below average play. So that's something to me that the set, the, the neglect for the center position, especially when you have a quarterback, a rookie quarterback, what are we seeing right now? In, in the first couple of weeks, it wasn't misses. It wasn't like them getting beat. It was them not being in the right position, not having the right pass protection, being in the right area. What fixes that? A center, a really good center, which we just neglect to get a Zach Frazier and, and fix the, a lot. The damning thing is we go back to even Lucas Patrick. We're going to get this yep. guy. Why? Because he, he's experienced with the scheme. We're going to get Shelton. To the offensive. We're going to get Shelton. Why? Because he's experienced with the scheme. This scheme is what you're investing on. <laughs> not only Brad, did you not to just a, fail? There were, I think, and I counted this over the summer because it pissed me off because I was like, we got to get one of them. I think there were six or seven Pro Bowl or former Pro Bowl centers changing teams, kind of just doing this like center roulette, and a lot of them just swap places. And one of the ones that swap places was Pro Bowl center Mitch Morse from the Buffalo Bills. And like you said, not only did you not get a center, you got a, a guard who played a few games at center backing up who? Pro Bowl center, Mitch Morse. And then you get his backup for draft capital when you could have just signed him. It's that we say this word arrogance lately a lot. That is such an arrogant move to say, I know everyone's going out and getting these centers, but I know better. I'm going to get the backup to the guy who everyone else wants because I know he's going to be better than this guy. And then, like you said, pro scouting talent, he has arthritis. It's why he's been missing all these games. This isn't a shock to anybody. This isn't arthritis doesn't pop up overnight. Ryan Bates has been dealing with an arthritic shoulder and elbow for years. And you go out and you spend draft capital on that guy because your ego probably did that because you tried to get him the year before you couldn't get him. So now you're going to absolutely put the nail in that coffin. Like I like centers that play center, you know, like that's uh call me crazy, but it's like, uh, you know, that's, that's my number one criteria. Lucas Patrick played majority at guard. And we're like, this is our center, even though he was a backup, but he was thrusted in because the Packers line was always banged up. So to, it's to that one of the pressure. best Hall of Fame quarterbacks. Like, yeah, going to make your job a lot easier because he Aaron gets the ball. Out. Yeah. Aaron Rodgers exactly. back there. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so we've, like I said, I mentioned chess and checkers and that comes from a quote that Yurko said on ESPN 1000. And he said, listen, as a lineman, when we get into a game, we start with checkers. If I could just physically manhandle you, we don't get to the whole hand fighting martial arts bullshit. I'm just going to grab you and throw you. And then go sack your quarterback. And you're totally seeing it with Colin Shelton. He's undersized. He gets tossed around. It's great, but you know the scheme, right? It, We're going to outsmart you. And with the defensive line picks, too, I've actually not been big fans of it because, you know, going back to the stats and everything, when you see physical athletes that have lack of production, like a Dominique Robinson, Javon actually follows into that in Zach Pickens, typically they do not pan out. What Javon is doing is an outlier thing, being yes. really good, and he deserves all the credit in the world for how he's transformed his body, how much effort he's putting in. Because actually, I think Yurko and like others have talked about this, where it's that whole Mike Tyson thing. Everybody has a plan until they get hit in the mouth. And the reason why those really good athletes at D-line don't pan out is because as soon as they get hit, they're going to try and throw you, which at that case, 
typically if you're not that great and you weren't able to really do that and to have success at the NCAA level, you're not going to have that same success in the NFL level. And that's why you see them kind of really start to struggle at that NFL level. So Jervon, to me, kudos to him, but typically you see them looking more like what Zach Pickens is right now, where Pickens just looks lost because he's like, I can't beat you with my athleticism. I didn't do that in college, but, and it still doesn't work here. That third round pick should have been an offensive lineman instead of Zach Pickens. And, and so like, like you were saying about just um, pure analytics. Okay. I think the only guy I could really think of right now is like Max Crosby was a fourth round pick. Mm -hmm. There's very yeah. few guys that like, well, who Jared Allen might've been undrafted. But I mean, yeah. you really have to like go search and do your homework to find guys that have gone in late rounds and panned out. And um, most of the at, time, at they're position. they're hustle guys, they're high energy yep. guys. John Randall, Hall of Famer from the Vikings, undersized defensive tackles because he just never quit. He never got tired. Max Crosby never quits. He never gets tired. John, uh, like you said, uh, sixty nine. Who was uh, Jared Allen? Jared Allen. Jared yeah. Allen was a hustle and motor guy. It wasn't that they were like these physical freaks that kind of came out and just dominated everybody. It was because you had the same thing about him as the same thing that you say about a wide receiver who's drafted late. Well, Wes Welker is shifty and Julian Edelman is shifty and quick and Puka Nakua, he just kind of finds those zones and right. Like it's the same phrases, but that's why to your point, Paulie, it's just, it's a waste of time when you do this shit with, with third round defensive tackles when you could go out and get a free eight. you just got chris williams from the browns for a seventh round pick just do that in the future save those third round picks for offensive linemen yeah and so then just moving up the ladder one step and okay so ryan poles deserves some criticism as well here right but the obvious thing that should have been done here today was to move on from the staff at minimum scapegoat the offensive coordinator, but really you should have moved on from the staff in the last off season. Now it's obvious that you should do it. And to just sit there and waste more time till the end of the season is a waste. But part of me questions whether they'll even do it in the off season moving forward. And so now you get into a conversation about ownership and why, well, we might be too cheap to keep a guy on the books while we hire another guy. And that that is ownership interference that we're dealing with. And even though and, and David, I don't I, I know you're gonna make a lot of points here probably. So I don't want to like kill it right as you get started. But Ooh, for I just hate this conversation because to me it always feels like that cheap, cheap way out. Like when we said hey this is the best team a number one overall pick has ever stepped into and we were all high on it during the offseason. We weren't crediting McCaskies. We weren't that that conversation doesn't exist until everything bombs and fails. And so we've gone like I love the question, like you said, and I haven't really answered it, but the percentage of blame fr from bottom to top. And so, of course, things on the field could always be better. The coordinator's not doing him any justice. The head coach is responsible for enabling all this. The GM is responsible for putting all this supposed talent on there that isn't gelling isn't is built outside in and it's just unorthodox but now you know at the end of the day there is ultimately people up top that have to pay the price and like i said i i mean they don't have to pay the price they won't they're not going to sell the team it's not going to change which is why i find it to be a nuisance conversation and i'm not going to have much more input on it than that but dave I, we go back and forth on this all the time i know you're pretty damn yeah. passionate about it starts at the top and it doesn't start at the bottom. Like I think it starts at the bottom. Uh, I'll present to Brad kind of like what we've discussed in many, many episodes and all this stuff over time. But it's it's one of those uh, chicken or the egg kind of problems, right? Where even yesterday we were arguing about this yesterday. Well, you, you can't you can't blame the G the GM for not making moves if the his bosses are strongly suggesting wink wink that we don't want to pay another coach or that they're strongly suggesting that this is for the integrity of the Chicago bears before you make any moves, Ryan always think, is this good for the bears? Cause once you guess what we're a history when you're gone, they'll still be here, Ryan. So remember that before you make moves, because you can't convince me otherwise that George doesn't have some sort of influence over Ryan Poles long-term, 
But the other part of it is what we've talked about is, uh, you know, you, you like other sports, Brad, you know, the Cubs, once they sold from the Wrigley family to the Ricketts, you know, you saw this massive overhaul. We used the Washington Commanders yesterday as an example. This is a team that is on the exact same timeline as the Bears were. And guess what happened? Bam, like instant success with a new ownership group that approaches things with modern ideas and modern philosophies. However, on the other hand, you have examples like the Texans where they just kind of hand the reins off to new GMs. They're kind of consistently successful. The TJ Watt or the JJ Watt years, the now the Deshaun Watson years, whatever that was worth to you, you know, they were really successful at the time. Now they're back on a thing of success, right? So there are times Jim Irsay, absolutely crazy, coked out, you know, NFL owner. You got success there. You have a Super Bowl there. Why? In my I mean, mind, it's because he, and because he man. hires Bill Polian and he fucks off and does coke out of strippers buttholes like that's literally what he got arrested for this guy is insane but he leaves his team alone and then he just rides the success and then you have your jerry joneses of the world which is to me just the nfc's jim ursay who loves to have his finger on the pulse of that team so in these kinds of cases to me nothing will ever change until ownership changes the chicago bulls and the white Sox will never be relevant as long as a reinsdorf is at the top we just have accepted that and i think to me, Paulie has almost talked me out of it because we have seen some moderate success growing with the Chicago Bears and the McCaskies were there. So to his point, it's kind of one of those things where it's chicken or the egg. I have to agree with Paul because the evidence in his point is there. But now when it does revert, now it's kind of like, well, my point is coming back. The ownership is still kind of a problem. I don't know where you stand on that. And just real quick, like wasn't Ryan Storff there while the Bulls did win six championships? same thing he fucked okay. off he got lucky with right. one guy. okay and he still was there when the white Sox won in 2005 right and so sure. so like you like you said jim mercy was there when bill pulley and peyton manning were there and, and so i get it there's examples of being overcoming yeah. I mean, and that's why i said like we're gonna really need caleb to be a superstar yeah <laughs> and, but and that's where right. i look at like kevin warren because to me hey if if i was a mccaskey right now i wouldn't sell you know i i'd be like hey this is my team my my grandfather, great grandfather, whatever, like built this team and everything like that. I'm looking at Kevin Warren going, isn't wasn't your job to do that whole Arlington Heights thing? And it's still not there yet. But also, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> like, what else is he also supposed to be doing? Because if Kevin Warren got me hope, because I don't think you're really gonna get rid of the McCaskies unless I've heard some other things just because of like taxes went it when because we all die when virginia eventually kicks the bucket i've heard that there's some weird tax things with that but i still don't think that they're ever going to be selling ultimately and moving on from it and but this is where it's like kevin warren kevin warren wants to do things different and kevin warren seems like a no-nonsense guy to me i want to see him kind of go out there and lay the hammer down and be like listen this is not how we build winners and then do that and then they're like hey i'm sorry for that we're going to be resuming this and so to me like with that whole percentages i actually put ownership at like the smallest and then i actually put coaches and players equally because dj moore i see him just dogging it out there and like has the you know he has the attitude of a five-year-old child um after he's not getting the ball after he just signed this gigantic deal He's not helping things and they're not executing. And so to me, it's players and coaches. And then it's like, then it's the GM. And then it's like small ownership just because they're simply not executing. That's my take on it. Also, J2K, what's good? I saw you out there too. <laughs> yeah, shout out to J2K, man. He's he's the best. Uh, did our whole branding for our channel or logo and everything like that. Oh, so do, cool. We have absolutely love J2K. Yeah. Um, I'm, I was... Cautiously excited as well, Brad, about Kevin Warren and the process of what he was going to, the prospects of what he was going to do with this team. I think within like six to 10 months, I realized quickly that guy is here for one reason, one reason only to head the development of a new stadium. And I think he has next to no input on football decisions. Um, I That's purely speculative, but when you just see, you know, Ryan doing all the, uh, the approach to re-signing DJ Moore 
putting his cap guy in the room and then giving it the presentation packet to Kevin Warren. And he flips through it quickly and goes like, looks good to me. He's a good player. He should stay here for a while. Like that's yeah. not a, that's not a team president that's going like, so, Hey, let's have like a full on thing. And this kind of goes back to what we started this with. What the fuck are you having one and a half hour meetings for before your press conference? What are you garnering? Yeah. Who's in that room? If Kevin Warren's in that room and George is in that room and all the coaches are in that room and Ryan Poles at the head of that table, who is saying anything of substance in this room that has any gravitas? Because there are too many goddamn cooks in this kitchen, first of all, right? When you have McCaskey interference, when you have uh, uh, Kevin Warren being this team president for what? I don't know what is his exact title. Um, what is going on here exactly? I have a, a great quote for you guys. I saw this come across today. If I can and just real quick, this David, down. just like meanwhile, John Gruden's getting up at four in the four a.m. to like watch tape, right? That's yeah. what we're talking about here. You're taking an hour yeah. and a half to figure out your press conference. So, uh, sorry, go ahead with yeah. the quote. All right, we understand your frustration. We're frustrated too. It would be a natural reaction to just say, "Back up the truck." And let's start a major overhaul. After a particularly disparaging loss, a season ticket holder told me, fire somebody. We deserve better than this. I get it. You deserve it. And your Bears deserve it to be winners. The decisions we announced today may not be the easiest or most popular, but we believe that they are the best decisions for the Chicago Bears. You guys want to take a guess who said that, when, why, what? George McCaskey in what year one of Flus? George McCaskey said that when they retained Ryan uh, Ryan Pace and Matt Nagy for the lame duck year over the summer. That's it, it sounds great job, eerily David. similar, right? It sounds eerily similar. And this is why you want to like, Polly, I'm never going to try to convince you because part of our fun thing is that we just bust each other's balls and yell at each other sometimes. Always try and convince me. I'm open to change. Yeah, but what the, f it is when you talk about, that isn't, that isn't a Kevin Warren quote. That isn't a Ryan Poles quote. That isn't a Matt Eberflus quote. That is a George McCaskey in regards to why they kept Ryan Pace and Ryan and Matt Nagy. It going into the season where they drafted Justin Fields. Everybody knew back then the writing was on the wall. It is completely pointless. It is a complete waste of time. You should rebuild and restructure and do all these things. And you let Bruce Arians walk out the fucking door and you let Chris Ballard tell you to go fuck yourself because he wanted to trade Jay Cutler. And you did, you said, not on my watch. So when you say, yeah, you can't blame ownership. These are, we're talking about fundamental direction changing decisions of a franchise that are stopped by one man and one man only, or whoever that one man and his underlings are. They're complete yes men, and they have zero, zero concept of not repeating your mistakes. They keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result. I never really liked that definition of insanity. I think it's like a good cliche, but it's not necessarily. This is fucking stupid. This isn't crazy. You're just stupid. You just so, don't get it. You're doing the same thing over and over and it applies four years later and you can see it. You don't need to observe a team from far away. It happened in your own fucking building and you're doing it again. So I know we've gone a little bit over our time limit and, you know, I know Brad's got to go. By the way, everybody in chat, Brad's got his A22 film breakdown that he's going to be doing after this show, so make sure you go check out Unbearable Sports and make sure you go and check out his content. And, you know, I'll just say it again. Like like I said, when we were saying this is the best team and number one overall pick has come into, we weren't crediting him. But I love what Brad said. I still put blame on the ownership. The percentage of it may not be as high as you do, David. I'm not saying they're not to blame. They are. It's just ultimately, I think there are other things that could be fixed a lot easier than McCaskey selling the team. Brad, I don't know. Any closing thoughts? Yeah, I guess closing thoughts. It's, uh, you know, like I've said, like what I started the show with, I am not a big fire the coach, fire the coach type of guy. But right now I am because I think that that is the best thing because when your team is giving up and you've already had two players only meetings as well, or like player meetings to come to uh, the coaches and talk to them. That's where they're, they've tried everything. 
And if, if they've tried everything, sometimes like there was an old uh, person I used to work with that said, if someone disagrees with you, did you try convincing them once? Didn't work. Did you try it again? All right. Well, some people don't want to, don't want to change. And sometimes, you, you know, with that, you just kind of have to move on. And to me, it's, it's one of those, you just have to move on. You just have to go through it because when they're in those rooms, they're not going to want to take to coaching until they know that. Things are moving forward because they know they everyone sees the writing on the walls. They know they're not going to be there. Yeah. So. You know, I had a I had a great teacher once go to the chalkboard and he drew a uh, six sideways. And he asked, "Is this a six or is this a nine? He's like, "Depends which way you want to turn it." Yeah. He's like, "But understand, if I'm passionately arguing with you that it's a nine, and you're passionately arguing with me that it's a six, I truly believe what I'm seeing and you truly believe what you're seeing. And you ultimately have to re have respect for that. Dave, any closing thoughts? George McCaskey's a fucking bitch. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Everybody, thank you so much for joining us. And